on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, one of America's leading urban public libraries, delivering exceptional services and programs with a mission to improve lives and build a stronger community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. Why wouldn't we engage people in spaces and in ways that again inspires them towards health and well-being rather than telling them that they need to be fixed or that they'll always have to be on this pill what have you why not engage them in a conversation of the possibility of the sheer magnificence of the human body the human mind the human spirit that can overcome almost anything and why would we reside only in the space of what is visible or what we think is visible why wouldn't we reside in that space that I was exposed to 20 some odd years ago, that space of possibility? Why shouldn't medicine inhabit that space too? Dr. Russ Greenfield directs integrative medicine for Novant Health, a regional healthcare system. He practices integrative medicine, which combines conventional medicine with complementary therapies to engage a person's innate healing capacity. He is also a consultant, focusing his efforts on corporate wellness programs, product development, and education. Dr. Russ is board certified in emergency medicine. He was one of the first four physicians to graduate from the program in integrative medicine from the University of Arizona College of Medicine under the direction of Dr. Andrew Weil. In this episode, we explore integrated medicine and wellness, the delivery of healthcare, and the work of leading systemic change. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Welcome, Russ. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. It's great to have you here. Russ, you are Medical Director of Integrative Medicine for Novant Healthcare. What is Integrative Medicine? My peers and I define integrative medicine as healing-oriented care that takes account of the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, family, community, and environment. We practitioners use any and all therapies, be they deemed conventional or complementary, with a different goal in mind, that being to engage what a person was born with, their innate healing capacity, such that a practitioner's role actually is to facilitate the innate gifts of healing that each person already has within them. And how is integrative medicine different from conventional medicine? Well, it takes into account conventional medicine. So, you know, we try and take an equation that often looks like either or, either conventional medicine or complementary, even alternative medicine. We try and take that equation and make it and. How to use the best of good conventional medical care together with healthy diet and lifestyle measures, as well as select complementary therapies that actually have some good evidence behind them. My peers and I in integrative medicine actually don't practice alternative medicine. By definition, alternative medicine pretty much implies we're not going to use conventional medicine. You know, Mark, I I like conventional medicine a lot. It has a lot of benefits. It also has limitations. Complementary therapies have their benefits and their limitations too. But for each unique individual, we like to believe that there's that right mix, that right blend that can bring forth those innate gifts of healing and help people reach their true potential. Can you give examples of conventional medicine versus alternative medicine versus integrative medicine. So at present, my focus is on helping people with cancer. And so this is an area where there's a great demand because there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of information, a lot of misinformation, even a lot of marketing out there, to be honest with you, about what people should do. So from a conventional medical perspective, there's a lot of focus, let's say, on surgery and chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, hormone therapy, all those kinds of things. And a lot of people have the view of the conventional approach to treating cancer, people with cancer rather, 
as being very harsh and kind of a shotgun approach, hurting healthy cells as well as unhealthy cells. An alternative medicine approach may be completely eschewing conventional medicine and saying, you know, we're just going to use herbs and we're going to do stress management. We're going to change your diet. We're going to use vitamins and supplements and you don't need that kind of stuff. A, an integrative approach would say, okay, look, how to use the best of conventional medical care together with safe complements to care to hopefully not only promote the successful treatment and outcome, but also to minimize and treat any side effects from treatment. And then beyond that, to help people heal and do whatever they can to prevent that cancer from coming back. So again, instead of either or, how do you create an equation that's and that helps people to participate more fully in their healthcare, stay away from things that might be pretty harmful, both on the conventional and complementary medicine spectrum, and engage in things that really can promote health and well-being. Wouldn't a conventional doctor say that that's exactly what they do? One of the challenges here is that the complements to care, such as, let's say, acupuncture or dietary measures to help people to stay well, or even mind-body therapies, up until the past five to 10 years, many practitioners had never been exposed to this. We certainly don't get in a medical school, internship, residency, fellowship training. I had to go out and do a two-year fellowship uh, in addition to my regular training to try and figure out where is there evidence of safety? Where is there evidence of danger? And where is there promise? So in large part, I think for any of us, we go through training and what we've been exposed to, that's our truth with a capital T. We're, We're exposed to something else that's outside of that realm. It has to be well, of questionable efficacy because we never got exposed to it before. Maybe what has to happen, and this is in large part what many people are really putting a lot of energy towards in integrated medicine, is changing the system of healthcare education, not only for physicians, but for nurses, for pharmacists, and ultimately for all of us. Because as I like to say to folks, and this is not original with me, the entire healthcare debate I've been having for years now has very little to do with healthcare. It has everything to do with who's going to pay for health care. But the discussion about the content of health care has really yet to be held. We want to see it be an integrative approach to care because it has to do with things that people can do on their own, how they eat, how they manage their stress. What does a personalized exercise program look like? How do you help people sleep? Those types of things together with the best of conventional medical care and select complementary practices that actually offer honor and respect to complete systems of healthcare like Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, things of that nature, that can be used together uniquely for each individual. Like it or not, we're all going to have to take more responsibility for our health and well-being in the future because it's not going to come from government. It's not going to come from the healthcare system. It has to come from us. And that means we have to have access to credible, actionable information. That's a big part of what we're trying to contribute towards. It seems everywhere you look, there's information about the benefits of diet and exercise and these complementary interventions. If it's everywhere, why isn't it anywhere in the healthcare system? Well, you know, I mean, it's got to be this way for you because I know it is for me. Sometimes it's just flat out overwhelming. There's so much information out there. And frankly, a lot of it is misinformation. And the part that really bothers me is so much of it is fear mongering. And that's not the way towards health. The way to to help people to be well is to inspire people towards wellness, inspire people towards ways they can act that might actually optimize their health and well-being. So it is everywhere. It's just not within the hallowed halls of academia or within many hospitals because it's still deemed outside the scope of conventional medicine. The scope of conventional medicine is, is usually... I would say based on what we call randomized control trials, a specific way to do research. There are certain things, though, Mark, that you just know as commonsensical. I mean, we know that helping somebody to manage stress, even our own stress, can translate not only into improved emotional health and well-being, but improved spiritual health and well-being, and by extension, improved physical health and well-being. So there are some things that certainly still need to be researched. What about this vitamin or herb? Does acupuncture really work in this setting, whereas we know it works, for example, with nausea and vomiting and pain? Does it work in all settings? We need to study those kinds of things. But the offering to people, the the promise that there may be something more, that there may be a way to engage, again, their innate gifts of healing, I think that's inspiring. And most of the patients that I have the good fortune to meet with think so too. 
When a person has heart disease or a person has cancer, uh, they look for a specialist. And by definition, a specialist is someone who is well-versed in that particular field. Is specialization counter to the very notion of integrative medicine? It's a really great question, and I think you'll get different answers from different people. When I applied to the program in integrative medicine during its first year back in 1996, the stated goal of the program was to transform healthcare and make it really be about health not just disease management. And that appealed to me. So when I went out there, I was looking around saying, you know, how are we going to define this? What exactly is this? And one of the things that I love from the moment that I got out there is what I said, the goal of this program is not to create a brand new specialty. Again, the goal is to right the ship of healthcare. And so ultimately the dream has always been to have the term integrative go away. It's just good healthcare. That stated, it's a challenge to be in integrative medicine and make a living. Because how do you bill for this? If Medicare doesn't have specific codes or insurance companies don't have specific codes because there's no established definition, it's not under the scope of conventional medical practice, how are you going to make a living? And so there are people who have created board certification in integrated medicine and things of that nature, not only to create the distinction between people who are very well versed in this and, as you said, expert in the field, but also to enable people to perhaps be able to make a living so that they can bill for it. My own bias, Mark, is an is important form because I've been really lucky and that I haven't had to make that decision. So I decided early on that the reason I was drawn to integrated medicine is because it was taking on this global behemoth with this belief that we can actually do this. We can make healthcare about health. I didn't want to go into a brand new field. I just wanted to contribute along with a lot of other like-minded people to make things better. Is it your view that all primary physicians should be practicing integrative medicine? I think they all want to, to be honest with you. I remember distinctly when I first came back to Charlotte in 2001, meeting with a wonderful internist, uh, one of the, the fathers of internal medicine really here in, in Charlotte named Bill Sugg, a wonderful man. And I was going around speaking to different groups, letting them know what integrated medicine was and especially what it wasn't and how I hoped that I could work with them and help them with their patients and not steal their patients. And in the middle of my discussion, Bill Sugg banged his fist on the desk and said, you know what really gets me mad? And you have to understand, I I speak to a lot of hostile audiences. They just happen to be my peers. So I was waiting for Dr. Sugg, what he was going to say. And I said, you know, Bill, what is it? And he said, for me to really do my job well, I need to send everybody to you because I don't have time to talk with people about all these things that I know are so important. How should they eat? How should they exercise? What about stress management? But the system doesn't allow me to do that right now because we are on a productivity standard now. He goes, so for me to do medicine right, I have to see patients and then send them right to you. This is crazy. And I agree with him. It's crazy. So in large part, what the integrated medicine movement is about is restoring value to the interaction between a person who at that moment happens to be a practitioner and a person who at that moment happens to be a patient. And the time that is involved in creating a healing relationship Because right now, time isn't reimbursed in that fashion. Insurance pays for intervention. It doesn't pay for prevention. Why are your peers hostile? Oh, uh, they think that I've gone to the dark side. (laughs) They, and anything that we don't understand is automatically, you know, out of bounds. And so my good fortune is that I have a credible background in attending medical school and internship, residency, and fellowship all in emergency medicine. And so I have the same two letters after my name as many people who are out there practicing. And then when I'm speaking to those peers and they're saying, oh, he's talking to us about alternative medicine, I try and make certain that they understand the distinction that I actually don't believe in alternative medicine. Um, But I do believe that there might be more that we can do for folks. And then when I start sharing some of the peer-reviewed research from journals that we all share and look at, all of a sudden it's not alternative medicine anymore because it's actually appearing you know, in evidence-based journals. One of the things that happens, however, is many practitioners are struggling to stay up to date in their own field, let alone figure out what might be going on with acupuncture or clinical hypnosis or um, vitamin D, whatever the case may be. So oftentimes it may appear in our journal, but we're turning the pages because we got to get to the really important stuff. 
I honestly think most of us knew this was important stuff when we first went into healthcare, when actually when the healing arts chose us. But all you get exposed to once you enter medical school is the science and the process. And then you get out in practice and it's hard. It just is. And so some of that art, some of that humanistic drive that, that pulled us into the healing arts in the first place really doesn't get fed a lot unless we go outside and, and make the effort on our own. And that's one of the beautiful aspects of integrative medicine is that for me and everybody I know who is involved in this sphere, it brings back the gift of having the opportunity to sit across from folks and again, in my chair, having learned some things that might help somebody and sharing that with them. But in the other chair, there are people who willingly tell me all kinds of things about their lives. And we learn a lot, those of us in integrative medicine, about perhaps how we should li live our own. Can your fellow doctors make money if integrative medicine was at the center of healthcare? I believe so. Remember, even when people take really good care of themselves, folks still get sick. They still get into car accidents. They still get heart attacks. Unfortunately, people still get cancer, even under the best of circumstances. So we still need people that we can work with on a, on a daily basis who are our primary care providers, who are the folks who help us when we have minor ailments, who are the folks who come visit us in the hospital when we have major ailments, and, and, and all of that. But integrative medicine is, again, the goal is to make, have the term go away. We just want the opportunity for anybody who's practicing healthcare, whether it be a surgeon, an obstetrician, a nurse, a pharmacist, whatever, to also be able to talk with people about, you know, for the person who has high blood pressure and is, let's say, somewhat overweight, you know, research shows very clearly that if that person were to healthfully lose five pounds, or if I should say 5% of their body weight, they might be able to cut back on the amount of blood pressure medication that they use. And how do they do that? Well, it might be a combination of changing their diet just a little bit, exercising perhaps on a, more, on a regular basis, getting adequate sleep, because when they're not getting adequate sleep, they can gain weight, managing stress. It's not through vitamins and supplements and things like that. So how can we make it such that when you enter the healthcare system as a patient, regardless of circumstance, that you're entering an integrative practice? Russ, it strikes me that doctors give that advice all the time about losing weight and exercise and eating better. How is that different from what they already do? I can only speak to my own experience. So I, I tell folks all the time, um, you know, when I first got out and started practicing, and yeah, I knew about stress management and you got to exercise, you got to eat right, you know, you got to get enough sleep. But then if a patient asks me, okay, how do I do that? That's a very different question. So how do you eat healthily? Well, you know, oh, Russ, what should I have for breakfast tomorrow? Well, I, you know, I, I have to send you to a nutritionist. Russ, what kind of exercise should I do as opposed to somebody else? Well, I might need to send you to an exercise physiologist or a trainer. Well, how should I get sleep? Well, if you're not getting that sleep, maybe I need to send you to a sleep specialist, you know? And so if we can't answer those questions for our patients, at least at the foundational aspect, what are we doing? Are we just triaging? Are we not really taking care of the entire person? And then frankly, if we're promoting this space, we all have to be good role models for healthy living. How many healthcare providers are walking around not optimally well? How many of them are overweight? How many of them are stressed, depressed? How many are actually sleeping well? How many are adhering to what might be termed even loosely a healthy diet? So we have a disconnect here. And the disconnect we often talk about between patients who know what they could be doing to take good, better care of themselves but don't but the same disconnect exists within people in healthcare. So, you know, we're all just people. So I honestly think that indeed that information is often shared in a global perspective. Yeah, eat better. Yeah, get some exercise. What does that mean? And how do you individualize it for the person sitting before us who's completely different than the past people that we've seen earlier in the day? Russ, what is the surest way to remain healthy? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> You know, we in integrative medicine define health as balance, and that is borrowed, if not stolen, um, from um, Asian medicine, where balance is really very important energetically, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And part of the realm of balance is enhancing resilience. So when we get a curveball thrown at us or 
we something unanticipated happens, how do we bounce back? How do we bounce back like little kids bounce back? You know, they can get hurt and yet they're up and running around again in, in no time. How do we help people bounce? And so I don't know that there's one single area that you know we should all commit to with regards to optimizing our health and well and our well-being. But I will share something that I've learned from my patients over the years that I share with select patients when it's appropriate. And it doesn't sound medical at all, but I'm convinced it is. And it wasn't like it was overtly shared with me. It's just something that you can see and in, in the words that people use. The centerpiece of healing, the centerpiece of being healthy is kindness towards ourselves. And for many people, that's not an easy space because we might confuse it with selfishness. We might say, well, I should be doing this or I should be doing that, or I'm the one who's usually helping out somebody else. I don't want to be in a place where I have to accept care or help from somebody. We're not talking about being selfish. We're talking about sustaining oneself so that we can have the energy to continue doing our good work. Again, Chinese medicine puts forth this very interesting philosophy that those who give and give and give, even from the best of places, but if they don't take time to replenish those energies, they run the risk of becoming depleted. And probably many of us know that space of depletion, but we're able to come back out of it. But what if you just keep on giving? What if you just keep on going? And all of a sudden you've used up your reserves. Does it cause illness? No. Does it open the doorway to illness? Very likely. Russ, we're having a flu epidemic. Do you think it's because of the strain of the flu? Or do you think there's something else going on in terms of the general health of the population that is not resilient to these kinds of impacts? It's a great question. I think it's probably both. You know, the flu season every year, it's very, it's more than unfortunate. It kills tens of thousands of people around the, the globe, the flu. And you might think it's simple flu. It feels really bad for a few days, but then you get better. Well, not everybody does. And this year, we're seeing young children killed. Back in 2009, we saw young, healthy adults killed from H1N1. There are all different kinds of flu viruses that have come around. The flu vaccine offers some degree of protection, but it's far from perfect. So what can we do for ourselves? Well, you know, we have to manage our stress. We have to eat healthily. We have to do all the things that you and I have been speaking about. Frankly, though, we don't. And so it's not like it's anybody's fault if they come down with the flu. You know, it's everywhere, you know, and uh, sometimes we can fight it off more easily than, than others. But we place ourselves in a better position to avoid getting the flu or at least make it less likely to be dangerous. When we actually do go out and get the flu vaccine, I really strongly recommend that people do each year, but also take good care of ourselves in the other ways that we've spoken about. Many people say that the U.S. healthcare system is the best in the world. Is it? In some ways it is. You know, I honestly think that, you know, I'm biased in this regard because my background was, was in emergency medicine. And so if, if a person unfortunately ends up with a medical or surgical emergency or urgency, you want to be in the United States. It's the best care bar none. As far as how we do on an overall basis, my teacher, Dr. Andrew Weil, used to stand in front of medical students. I used to watch this and it was, it was, it was kind of painfully funny because he would ask, he would say to the students, you've now, committed, you know, multiple years to your training, untold hundreds of thousands of dollars towards your training, all towards going towards trying to help people. It's wonderful. It's great. So let me ask you guys, what is conventional medicine really good at? And all these kids would raise their hands and they'd say, we're really good at cardiovascular disease. And he goes, yeah, we're really good at treating it. How are we at preventing it? And, you know, everybody would go, oh, yeah, we really don't do a very good job of preventing and stuff like that. He goes, you know, we can, you know, we can rotor rooter arteries and we can replace them and stuff like that. But how about preventing cardiovascular disease in the first place? We don't do a very good job of that. Uh, so what are we really good at at conventional medicine? And so fewer hands go up now. And somebody says, well, we treat cancer pretty well. He goes, yeah, in some instances we do, but we use scattershot chemotherapy that hurts healthy cells as well. We're getting much better with that now. And treatment is becoming much more targeted and more and more people are living with cancer. So yeah, we do a pretty good job of treating cancer. We're getting better at it. How do we do it preventing cancer? And again, you know, people are like, oh, we don't do it. And so he said, well, let me, how about how are we at treating viral illnesses? 
How about autoimmune disorders? And he goes on and on and on. And honestly, we just don't do a very good job of preventing illness at all. Now, we've made, we, great people that we stand on the shoulders on who have done a wonderful job with regards to public health, clean water, taking care of sewage, all those kinds of things, vaccines. They've done a wonderful job. And indeed, conventional medicine has done a remarkable job in that regard. But beyond that, we have a long way to go. Russ, you have this new role. What do you hope to do in your new role? It's easy for people to say that they feel very fortunate in their new role, but I really do. Novant Health has a strong commitment towards um, integrative health care. They see this as a means of contributing towards population health, towards community health, but also as a reasonable and rational adjunct to the great conventional medical care that's offered in this community. Look, there's a number of hospitals in our, in our area, and they're great, and the people that work in them are great. But we work in a system that really isn't all that great. The healthcare system needs to be revised, and it needs to focus on health. So the emphasis within integrated medicine really is about health and healing, together with the best use of conventional medical care. How many people could really have a problem with that? Most people don't. But where the problem comes in is, who's going to pay for this? How do we create access to everybody to this type of care, regardless of socioeconomic status? What do you do about talking with folks about healthy eating when people live in food deserts? How do you talk with people about stress management with folks who have literally nothing or are, are in abusive or unsafe situ- circumstances and situations? How do we come together as a community to say, this is not just an issue for a given family or a given healthcare system. This is a, an issue for the entirety of our community. How can we show Charlotte to be a shining star for others to follow? And literally, when I was at the University of Arizona, I learned that one of the things that each of us suffers from is thinking in small terms. The program in integrated medicine was about changing all of healthcare. And I walked in there knowing, yeah, you can't change all of healthcare, but it's fun hanging around with all these hippies who really want to. And lo and behold, within six months, they were making major changes and contributions to the healthcare system. And I learned in that moment that Margaret Mead was right, that all it takes is a small group of committed citizens to change the world, and that indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So we have a small group of committed citizens, not just at Novant Healthcare, but in this community, who are committed to saying, How do we make things better? What could we do? We've got data here. We actually don't have to reproduce it. Now we've got to figure out what's the model. What would be a sustainable model that would create access for everybody and raise all boats when it comes to health and well-being? Well, a lot of people talk the talk. i got to tell you, thus far, and I've been there now three months, people are not saying no to me. And they're saying, look, we need to do this. It's important for our patients, and it's important for our staff, and it's important for us. So how can we live it, how can we show it, and how can we share it? So I'm like kind of out of my mind excited. I really am. I don't know what's going to be possible, but I haven't had obstructions put before me yet. And that in and of itself, I think, says a lot. You are playing an administrative role. Are you still practicing medicine? Absolutely. Number one, I really enjoy it. Number two, I hope to believe. I, I, I that I hope to live to the space where I can believe that I can help people still. But I see patients two days a week, and the other three days I'm doing my best to try and help build this program out. Because we're starting in the sphere of oncology, but the goal is to expand into every aspect of healthcare, women's health, pediatrics, cardiovascular disease, preventive care, primary care, you name it. Because, again, it starts out, it's integrative oncology, then it moves to integrative women's health, and then lo and behold, hopefully within a few years, the term integrator just goes away. This is just the way we do healthcare here in Charlotte, North Carolina, specifically in this instance at Novant Healthcare. But I trust that we'll be partnering with anybody and everybody to make certain that everybody benefits. Russ, I'd like to talk about your own journey. You grew up in a small town in Connecticut. Tell us about that. Yeah, Norwalk, Connecticut is, is a bigger town now, but back then it really was small. It was uh, only about 45 minutes from New York City, which was wonderful because every once in a while we could go into New York and eat wonderful meals or maybe in, uh, on the rare occasion um, get a chance to see a baseball game or on an even rarer occasion see a, a Broadway show. But it was nearby, and so there was 
all the you know the newspapers and the the TV shows and things like that uh, that were a lot of fun to watch. But I, I'm Jewish, and the, this little small town only had um, two other Jewish families, so it was. Uh, unique in that regard in a way that I actually think was beneficial for me because I grew up understanding early that I was a minority. And it wasn't like that was a bad thing. It was just an understanding that this is the way it is. Why is that important? Because the next phase of my life, I moved when I was 11 years old to uh, Long Island, New York, to a town where actually there were a lot of Jewish people. And one of the things I found is that most of my friends felt like, well, most of the world is Jewish. And I could tell them, you know, it really isn't. <laughs> and it's okay because I, I learned how to get along with people regardless of their background um, from an early age. And, and I would say that they learned how to get along with me. So I think I grew up with a sense of optimism about what could be rather than there being divisions based on what our upbringing was or our religion or things like that. I, I grew up in a, in a place where there were a lot of folks from different spaces. And when I was young, I didn't get exposed to anti-Semitism. And so it was, it was actually pretty easy for me. My brother is eight years older than I. Um, he did have um, direct cases of anti-Semitism, but as a young person, I was spared that. And so, uh, you know, I think about it now, I haven't really thought about it that much, to be honest with you, but I'm sure that was formative with regards to how I view the world and even how I view healthcare. How so? Well, healthcare, <laughs> I count myself and anybody who's in healthcare as among the most fortunate uh, of all people. And yes, there are problems. And yes, we have to practice in different ways. And yes, there's electronic medical records and there's all these different kinds of things. But at the end of the day, we get paid to do our best to help people. It doesn't matter who comes through the door. It was one of the things I loved about emergency medicine because if somebody had a problem, it didn't matter whether they could pay or not. You know what? We got the chance to take care of them. And in integrative medicine, one of the beauties here is, you know, it doesn't matter what your background, what your spiritual bent, what, how you like to eat, what your traditions are. There may be ways that you can participate in your own healthcare that would help you, help you to be well. And in that space, we want everybody to be well. So, you know, I grew up, I guess, a little bit on the Nami Pammy side of things, you know, where I had rose colored glasses on because that's just the way I grew up. Well, that's a nice, that's a nice way to grow up. And it brings to the fore possibility. I've been told before that I have a naive view of the world. I like being naive because there are much fewer boundaries when you look at the world that way. Russ, how would you describe yourself as a child? I was actually a pretty good kid. <laughs> I did not like to um, step outside the lines. And so uh, my... My dad was, uh, I suppose, very soft-spoken and just a, a really loved life and sunshine and planted flowers. And he was an engineer and he was a poet in real life, I think. And he, when he was 18 years old, uh, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis and was sent away to what was called a sanitarium and really had been told that his life was over. And he got out, he made a commitment to himself three days into his stay that he would get out in under a year. And he got out in 364 days. And one of the things I learned from him was joy and optimism and, you know, just moving forward. And people would always say about my dad, you know, the house could be burning down and Alex would find a, a way out and something positive about the experience. My mom had kind of a tough upbringing and was more, oh, I wouldn't say realistic. I might even say pessimistic. And um, she was more the uh, authoritarian in, in, in our household. And I just didn't want to cross that because whereas my brother would, if my mom said no, my brother would say yes, sometimes just uh, for, for the, uh, the purpose of it. Uh, me, I just wanted to stay away from that. And so I kind of learned to be, let's say, a little bit of a goody two shoes and, and how to toe the line and just not make waves. And so part of that, I think, informed me because I like things to be okay for people. I like people to be at peace. I like people to be well. I like things to be steady. And I know I like that in my own life. I didn't actually understand that about myself until I went into integrated medicine, however. I thought I didn't need the other stuff that people do because I'm cool. Hmm. And yet later in life, you have stepped outside the lines. Uh, you are 
in some ways, one might say, tilting at windmills with the hope of changing the healthcare system itself. So are you still that goody two-shoes person? I still think in some ways I am. It's just the difference is that I want to you know, go back to speak about my mom and dad for a moment. They were, they loved learning simply for the purpose of learning. So my dad just loved reading literature and poetry. And one of the things about that year in the sanitarium, the way he kept himself busy was he uh, memorized poetry. And so when I was a little kid, he used to recite poetry. And, uh, and I used one of those poems to actually ask my wife to marry me. Uh, fortunately, she said yes. And my mom really loved knowledge um, for its own sake. And it didn't matter what was laying around, whether it's physics or English literature or whatever the case may be. And so I think I got exposed, both my brother and I, to curiosity and the seeking of knowledge for its own sake and really learning about possibility. And so in that space of possibility, there is the realm where could people get better? Could people be healthier? Could people keep illness at bay? Might there be more that, that we could do? And I also grew up at a time where there was a lot of upheaval politically. I grew up in the days of John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King and you know, 1968 and all these different kinds of things. Well, in my family, um, we were liberals and we were, you know, especially I look, really looked up to my brother. And so in 1968, my brother was 18 years old and Bobby Kennedy was everything. And so when Bobby got gunned down and then, and prior to that, Martin Luther King got gunned down and the world was changing. And yet we believed that it could be better. We believed that it could be good. And we also believed that we had a responsibility to try and make it so. Well, you know, it doesn't take much to try and spin healthcare as a way that maybe we can try and make things better. Russ, were you drawn to medicine and science at a young age? Yeah, I was. Um, my probably right around age ten, uh, my brother was in a um, very bad car accident, and I remember going to the hospital somewhere around one thirty-two in the morning, and it was a small emergency department, and I heard my brother in there and my mom and dad were checking on him and I didn't understand everything that was going on, but I just knew that the hospital was pretty dark. And then we, you know, rolled my brother up to the intensive care unit and I was standing way behind. I could just see him from behind on the bed and, you know, they took him into the ICU and then we went into the ICU waiting room, which was dark and we were the only people in there. And so I sat down and silhouetted by the lone light coming in from the hallway, I saw my mom and dad embrace and break down crying. And I'd never seen my dad cry before, but now both of them were crying. And I still didn't really understand all that was going on. But three months later, my brother came out of the hospital and everybody was happy. So as a little kid, I was thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. You could take people from being really sad to being really happy. I think I might want to be a doctor. And that's honest to goodness where it all started. Russ, you went to Brandeis University yes, and studied science as an undergraduate. What were those years like for you? Um, they were anything but straightforward. <laughs> the, you know, um, I was a, a pretty good student in high school and things came pretty easily to me. And then I got to um, Brandeis and found out, wow, there's lots of good students and all of a sudden I have to work. And, you know, sciences are great, but boy, this political science course is really cool. And wow, oh, this social science and look at this art history course and so here I was, I was all set. I was going to go into healthcare and medicine. I was going to go to med school and I discovered all these other courses and I discovered other kids and I discovered dancing and I discovered, you know, hanging out with nice ladies and all kinds of things. And so the, I grew up a lot, I would say the first um, two years. And then um, I did fine in school, but it was in junior year where I started saying, you know, I got to really get to work. <laughs> And, and I really did. And, and I just, I think in those first two years, 18 and 19 and 20, even a little bit, it was just a lot of growing up and everybody goes through that. That was certainly my time. You then went to the Chicago Medical School and later to the UCLA Medical Center for your residency and fellowship. And you chose emergency medicine. Why emergency medicine? 
I knew all along I was going to be a small town family doctor. I, I hearken back to my days in Norwalk, Connecticut, and our family doctor there. And I wanted to know my patients. I wanted to know everybody from infancy all the way to their 90s, at least. I wanted to be friends with my patients. I knew I was going to be a small town family doc. Then the medical school that I went to was really awesome. I loved it because we had kids, kids, we had people from, you know, their early twenties all the way into their mid forties who were suddenly starting medical school and people with all kinds of unique experiences, but everybody engaged in, Hey, how can we help people? What do we want to do and how we do it? So during my second year, I took a, an elective in emergency medicine because I had no idea what it was about, but it sounded pretty cool. With that first class, I was like, wow, this is awesome, but I still want to do family medicine. And so the emergency physician said I could come and spend a shift with him, and I did, and I loved it. But I was still waiting for my first rotation in family medicine because I knew I was going to love it. I knew it, and it was. It was my first rotation in my third year, and I really did not like my family medicine rotation. I was like, oh, my gosh, I don't like this. It was just the way I made up. That's all. So I started going back to emergency medicine. I did more rotations, and I traveled. I did a rotation in New York City, a rotation in Akron, Ohio, a rotation at the trauma center in, at, in Denver, and, I, and then a rotation right near here in Winston-Salem. So I did four different electives in emergency medicine. I was locked in. And then I went to Harbor UCLA because I wanted to see everything. So I wanted to see trauma. I wanted to see gang stuff. I wanted to see unique infectious diseases from all over the globe. And I did because I wanted to be able to say, if I go to, if I can practice here, that means I can settle and work anywhere. And it was an extraordinary experience. And I ultimately did a fellowship in emergency medicine at the same institution. There is a lot of adrenaline in emergency healthcare. And now you're an integrative medicine uh, specialist who calms people down. How do you square those two parts of your personality? It's a great question. And honestly, I get asked that a lot. Like, this doesn't make sense for us. Part of it was that uh, back in the day when I was working in emergency medicine and night shifts and weekends and trauma and all kinds of stuff, and people would talk about the stress of it and that it's a young man's game and stuff. And I was like, that's baloney. That, you know, that's other people. That's not me. I can do this forever. I eat this stuff. But I wouldn't say that out loud. I just knew in, in, in my gut. I was like, that's for other people. But I started looking around in the emergency department and I would see unhappy nurses, unhappy patients, unhappy doctors, unhappy administrators, really unhappy insurance company people. And I was going, something's wrong here. And so I found out about this program that said, we want to write the ship of healthcare. And I'm like, okay, I want to see what the data are. Let me see if I can get in. And I was fortunate enough to get in. But I looked all throughout the application, Mark. I wanted to see, are they going to ask me to look at me? Because I don't need to look at me. I don't need this psycho stuff. You know, I'm an emergency physician. Again, I eat this stuff. But I didn't see it in the application. I got there and I looked and very gingerly, very slowly, and very smartly, not overtly, they asked us to look at ourselves. You know, what are we about? And that's what happened to me is I went in kicking and screaming, but came out understanding I'm just like everybody else. Well, let's talk about what you went into. In 1997, you pursued a fellowship that changed the course of your practice that you've just alluded to. What happened? What was that fellowship? It was the program in integrative medicine. And it was the, its very first year of existence at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. Myself and three other physicians were the first people to go through this um, experience, and it was an experience. The very first day of the fellowship, we were asked the question by, by Andrew Weil, how do you define healing? And we all struggled with that. How do you define health? And we all struggled with that. We didn't have a tough time defining illness or disease. So how can we possibly have a healthcare system when we don't have an agreed upon definition of health? It was an extraordinary experience. And just if I might share just one quick story, which laid the foundation for me, is we had a professor of virology, person, PhD studier of viruses, who was helping us explore the science of paradigm shifts, you know, like what Copernicus did and others after and before. He said, but you're talking about a paradigm shift in healthcare. So let me propose something to you. I would propose to you that there are three forms of knowledge. There is belief, there is opinion, and there's fact. And so it's the second day of the fellowship. We're all sitting back and we're all nervous. We're like, okay, that sounds good. He goes, okay, so give me a fact. 
And somebody in the group said, well, the Earth is round. He goes, that's great. The Earth is round. We've got geologic data. We have data from space. We have mathematical data. The Earth is round. Give me a fact in medicine. So we were all kind of nervous and nobody really said anything. He goes, well, look, I study viruses. How about the HIV virus causes AIDS? And we're like, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, certainly strong association. He goes, but if the HIV virus causes AIDS, why, thank goodness, are there so many people walking around who are HIV positive who don't have AIDS? What if it's a protein that causes AIDS, but it's only activated in the presence of the virus? And in that moment, everything changed for me. Emergency medicine is very linear. You follow algorithms. If it's not this, you go farther down the algorithm. But it doesn't take long in, to be in healthcare to figure out that people aren't linear. There's possibility within each person. The dogma of medicine changes almost daily. The possibility with, that resides within each person never changes. Our goal should be, how do we bring that possibility forward into reality? Second day of the fellowship, and everything changed for me. And how did that change play itself out? after the fellowship for you? I suppose in a couple of different ways. One is uh, it helped me to be bold, to be honest with you. Here were these people who said, we're going to change all of healthcare. And that was really nice. But then I saw that they did. But it all started with me changing, seeing that I had the same weaknesses and gifts and desires as most people walking around. And how do we take advantage of that in a way that not only helps us individually, but helps us communally and beyond? How do we work in a way that gives us some sense of purpose and meaning that we can actually have context in while we're in the midst of it? Oftentimes, we figure out content, context and meaning and purpose in, in retrospect. Is there a way that we can do that while we're actually engaged in our day-to-day? -day? And that's part of what integrated medicine gave me. So I was the recipient the very fortunate recipient of wonderful experiences and training. My responsibility was, how do I bring this to the fore to help the largest number of people in collaboration with other people who also see the same possibilities that I do? It's been 20 years since your Integrative Medicine Fellowship. It's now 2017. Your fellowship was in 1997. And since that time, you were medical director at Carolina's healthcare system. You had your own practice, your own consultancy, including for Harris Teeter. And now you are the director of integrative medicine for Novant. How would you assess where we are 20 years later? Some things are extraordinary. You know, 20 years ago, I remember this distinctly when I left Charlotte to go to Arizona. Um, the wise didn't offer yoga because many people thought that it was a religious practice. Nobody knew about omega-3s or whether they should take vitamin D or not or what mindfulness meditation is. All of these things have actually found their way into the public domain and to the public discourse. And so I would not compare Dr. Andrew Weil to Galileo, but Galileo was punished for writing in the language of the common people so that people everywhere could have access to this. Andrew Weil has been pilloried for writing, not necessarily in the research journals, but writing for the masses about ways that they could take good care of themselves. And so one of the things that I think is fascinating about this is that in many ways, it's not the people with two letters after their name like me who are leading the charge. It's everyday folks who are saying, how can I take more control over my health and well-being? Why would I give that over to somebody else, even if they're a physician? So the partnership potential that, that exists here between people who are trained in healthcare and people who simply want more health and well-being, I think it's extraordinary. The only challenge is that conventional medicine hasn't completely caught up, in large part because the question always comes down to, who's going to pay for this? And thus far, insurance doesn't. Russ, where do you hope we are 20 years from now? I would like to believe that in short order, there will be significant changes in healthcare overall. We talk about patient-centered care and the patient-centered home and things like that, but the focus still isn't completely on the person who at that moment has to call themselves a patient. When you walk into a healthcare system or a doctor's office, 
you're often bombarded by sights and sounds and smells that let you know this is not a place you want to be. Why wouldn't we engage people in spaces and in ways that, again, inspires them towards health and well-being, rather than telling them that they need to be fixed or that they'll always have to be on this pill, what have you? Why not engage them in a conversation of the possibility of the sheer magnificence of the human body, the human mind, the human spirit that can overcome almost anything? And why would we reside only in the space of what is visible or what we think is visible? Why wouldn't we reside in that space that I was exposed to 20 some odd years ago, that space of possibility? Why shouldn't medicine inhabit that space too? Russ, I hear echoes of Bobby Kennedy. Don't ask why, ask why not. Indeed, indeed. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. What a privilege. Russ Greenfield is Director of Integrative Medicine for Novant Health. He earned his bachelor's degree in general science from Brandeis University, his MD from the Chicago Medical School at the Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science, and completed a residency and fellowship in emergency medicine from Harbor UCLA Medical Center. And now, a personal word. After you spend any time with Russ Greenfield, when you depart, he says, be well. He signs all his emails with the same phrase. He has a countenance about him that is kind and compassionate. His very essence is a wish for you to live a long and healthy life. It's a bit like being with the Dalai Lama, except Russ wears jeans. The analogy may be apt. Just as His Holiness the 14th and current Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso, lives in exile, seeking Tibetan Buddhist independence from Chinese occupation, so Russ Greenfield has lived in and out of exile from the insurance-driven American healthcare system. He is seeking independence from a system of sickness and intervention to create one of wellness and prevention. Just like Chinese officials become angry at the mere mention of the Dalai Lama, so many hospital administrators and doctors sometimes get angry at Russ Greenfield. But I suspect the current healthcare establishment gets frustrated with Russ not because he is wrong, but because he is right. That is always the response to a prophetic voice. Russ is saying what everyone knows. Healthcare shouldn't be what it is. It doesn't have to be what it is. If we built a system based on what drew healthcare providers into the profession to begin with, the desire to help others heal and be well, healthcare would be very different. What physicians and nurses studied and practiced would be different. The time with patients would be different. Encounters based on the powers of our mind and bodies would be different. Healthcare would be inspiring. In Tibetan Buddhist lore, Ave Loke Te Savara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, has a special relationship with the people of Tibet and intervenes in Tibetan history by reincarnating as benevolent rulers and teachers. In 1391, a child named Pima Dorje was born in a cattle pen. He was entrusted to the care of a Buddhist monastery where he became a monk. At ordination, he changed his name to Gendun Drup. He was soon recognized as an exceptionally gifted student and became abbot of one of the leading monasteries in Tibet. His energy and ability became legendary. He became known as the greatest scholar saint in Tibetan history. Recognized as having attained Buddhahood, upon his death, his legacy was considered. Surely he was the reincarnation of Ave Loke Tesavara, and he was given the title Dalai Lama, or Great Teacher. When a Dalai Lama dies, a new Dalai Lama is not chosen, but found. The high lamas of the Gelgupa tradition of Tibetan Buddhism search for a person in which Ave Loke Te Savara has reincarnated. They look for visions and signs. When they find a person they suspect may be the next Dalai Lama, they employ a series of tests to ensure that a rebirth has indeed happened. One test is whether the candidate can identify items 
that secretly belonged to the previous Dalai Lama. Perhaps Russ Greenfield is a reincarnated bodhisattva. I think he just might be. Compassion does radiate from him. He is on a quest to heal our bodies and lift our spirits. He does seem quite ageless. We would be wise to learn from him and be reborn ourselves. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Thank you to my partners, Andy Go, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you.